Everybody does it. You see the Christmas lights and you see uh, the Christmas trees and you see the decorations and you see this uh, a new energy, a, a different feeling that begins to happen. All of a sudden, there, you know, there's new songs that you can listen to. There's eggnog flavoring you can put in your latte. It's awesome. All right, peppermint's just so much better in, in the Christmas season. It, you, you have a reason to go shopping for some of you. You know, Christmas just kind of changes things. It brings a different feeling. And then to add on top of that, you add a little bit of snow, and, and then all the brown goes away. And it's wonderful, right? And you just need a little bit of snow, just a little bit, just on, you know, especially Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and then, then it could go away, that'd be fine. Um, except now I have a snow plow, so I get to play in the big snow. So that's awesome, I like big snow too. So I, I wanna ask you, what, what makes you happy? What, kind of what f- makes you feel good. Maybe it's not Christmas. Maybe for some of you, that feel good feeling comes from sitting at a beach on a hot sunny day. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I see. So we, we'll pray for you. It's all right. But I want you to think about your life. Think about what makes you feel good. I, I have a list here. Maybe some of these things you can say, well, I, I, that makes me feel good. How about how about sleeping in without setting the alarm clock? Yeah, right? How about, uh, for some of us, food? Food makes us feel good, right? Uh, for some, it's video games. How about finding money on the, on the ground? Like, the coins, that's something special, but when you get a dollar bill, like, that just, that, it makes the day good, Right? There's something about that makes you feel good. How about your sports team when they're winning? Maybe for some of you, it's uh, traveling. For some of you, it's hanging out in the garage. It's, uh, you know, it's working on projects. It's working on cars. It's just being in the garage and, you know, the grunting and sweating and that kind of thing. For some, it's coffee. All right, how many of you need that morning caffeine and the afternoon caffeine? And the evening caffeine, right? All right. So, uh, feel good. Uh, hanging out with friends. For some, it's movies. For some of you crazy people, it's exercise. For some, feeling good means you get more likes on Facebook than somebody else, right? Or you, you have more friends. Uh, for some of you, feeling good is having the new tech stuff, the new gizmo. Whatever the latest, brightest, biggest, baddest thing is, right? For some, it's clothes. Like when when we have things in life, when we when we get things, it makes us feel good. Whether we get a compliment or whether we get money or or whether we we you know get to experience a gift, those things make us feel good, and they all of a sudden they create this euphoria inside of us that we want to repeat that. We want to do it again. We want, we want another compliment. We want some more money. And all of a sudden, we want, that's what we're chasing after. But let me ask you this question. Is that what Christmas is? Is Christmas one of those things that we are chasing after, that we try to get something, and then once the, the month is over, we pack everything up and we put it back in storage for another few months? We... Um, how many of you have had, had somebody ask you the question, what do you want for Christmas? Right? The older I get, I realize how challenging that question is for me. Because uh, the older I get, my toys and my wants get bigger and more expensive. Right? And so when my wife or my in-laws or my family, you know, they ask, hey, what do you want? You know, I don't know what to tell them. Because what I really want is, you know, things they can't afford and things I'm not going to get. Um, and so a lot of times I'm just like, well, just, you know, I, when they ask me what you want for Christmas, my normal response is my two front teeth. But, because that just song just pops up all the time. But normally what I do is I say, well, give me a gift card or give me money. But that's not exciting, right? For the giver especially, that's like, that's kind of boring. 
Well, I ran across a, a story about a guy who had the same kind of dilemma. He, he always had his family asking him, what do you want for Christmas? And, and he always struggled with this. And he said, I really want to tell him that I want a red Ferrari, but I know it's not going to happen. And he says, so, so I don't know how to help them understand how to answer that question, what do you want for Christmas? And so what he did was he created a flow chart. He made a flow chart and he presented it to his family so that he could help them understand what the, the dilemma is he goes through. So I want to share this with you because it might help us. So the question is, what do you want for Christmas, right? And so he has a decision to make. And if he says, yes, I want a Ferrari, he knows that on Christmas morning, he's probably going to receive one of the following, a Vanilla Ice Greatest Hits, a Mr. Belvedere or Small Wonder DVD box set, a membership to the Tweezer of the Month Club, a pink Snuggie, a sausage gift basket, or a towel, right? And if he says nothing, if, if he's asked the question, what do you want for Christmas? He says, ah, nothing. Well, he knows that one of those things are going to show up on Christmas morning. But then he says, but the tension is, is that if I actually answer, well, I'd like an eight-pack of undershirts from Costco, on Christmas morning, you know what he's going to get? An eight-pack of undershirts from Costco, right? There's this tension that we're trying to figure out, how do we... How do, we, uh, how do we answer that question? But we tell our kids all the time that Christmas isn't about gifts. Christmas isn't about what you get, right? It's about Jesus, and it's not about the presents, and it's not about the amount, and it's not about uh, the, pre the, the gifts that we get. And so I think there's a shift that we need to make in our thinking, and a shift that I want to challenge us this month to begin to process is a shift from Christmas being an event to Christmas being an awakening or an attitude, okay? And so what I mean by that is Christmas, a lot of times we look at Christmas as an event that happens in December that we decorate for, we prepare for, we gather for, and then when it's done, we put it all away. But what if we make a shift in our minds, a shift in our attitude, a shift in our thinking that understands that Christmas is not an event, but rather it's an awakening, it's an attitude, it is a mindset, a lifestyle that we buy into about what Christmas is. And all of a sudden we understand that Christmas is not one time a, a year, but Christmas can happen all year long. We can tell each other Merry Christmas in the middle of summer. And understand that Christmas is this attitude, this mindset, the spirit of understanding that it's about Jesus. So normally during Advent, you know, this is the first Sunday of Advent, we're anticipating Christmas, we're preparing for Christmas to, to celebrate the birth of Jesus so normally we pull out the sermons on Mary and Joseph and, and the manger and, and the shepherds and the angels, and we say, turn to Luke chapter 2, right? Well, this year we're going to do things a little different. This year, instead of looking at how Christmas came to be, we're going to look at the impact Christmas has, okay? And this is helping us understand this mindset, mindset shift of Christmas not being an event, but an awakening, an attitude, a lifestyle. And so uh, we're going to do things a little different. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10. And if you're using a pew Bible, turn to page 891, 891 in the pew Bible. If you don't have a Bible, write your name in there. You take that Bible home with you. That is our gift to you. But we're going to look at how Christmas can be an awakening that we join by looking at the life of a man by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. So as we look at this, there are a handful of shifts that we have to make that we're going to pull out of this passage uh, in our lifestyle that we can apply even today, we can apply this month of how we're going to respond and how we're going to uh, treat Christmas different. And the first shift that we have to make is from feel good to do good. From feeling good to doing good. All right, and so that's the first shift that we're going to focus on. So in verse 1, Acts chapter 10, verse 1, at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. Okay, and we're going to stop right there, verse 1. In Caesarea there's a man named Cornelius 
who's a part of the Italian regiment. So there's some things we need to understand about the backstory of, of this verse because it kind of sets everything up for us. Caesarea is in the northern part of Israel. Caesarea, uh, in Caesarea, King Herod had built a temple to honor uh, Caesar Augustus. He built three temples for Caesar Augustus. This is one of those that, take, that uh, was built at Caesarea. The temple was built next to the mouth of a cave. And everybody was super excited about that because they believed that the mouth of the cave was the gateway to the underworld. And all of a sudden, this temple, when they were so close and so in the proximity to the underworld that they celebrated it. Caesarea was known as Sin City, the original Sin City. All right, we call Las Vegas Sin City because, because there is no rules and you live free and it's all about your pleasure and it's about how you feel good and you do whatever you want. Well, Caesarea was that plus more. Caesarea was pure evil. Caesarea was, was Satan's turf. That was Satan's playland. And, and so all of a sudden, we, we have this idea, we, we learn that this man named Cornelius lives here in Caesarea. He lives in Sin City. He, he lives in the evilness, the, the, the hor horrific thoughts of, of what happens sexually and, and uh, crime and, and all kinds of other things. This is where Cornelius is. Cornelius is a Gentile. Caesarea was part of the Roman Empire. Uh, a Jew would never have thought of going into Caesarea. A, a Jew, uh, they had to remain pure. There was no way they were getting close to Caesarea. But so what we find here is this man named uh, Cornelius who lives in Caesarea, sin city, pure evil, Satan's playland. And we're told that he's a part of the, of the Roman Empire. He's a part of the Roman army. And the Roman army, uh, they would have groups, it was called a legion, it would be 6,000 men would be a legion as part of the army. Of those 6,000 men, they would be broken down into cohorts of 100. Each cohort of 100 men, there was a leader, and that leader was called a centurion. Cornelius is a centurion in the army. So Cornelius is this leader, this this leader of men, he is in the army, he is a leader in the army, he has a hundred men under his influence. A Gentile living in a horribly sinful, evil city. Okay? We go to verse 2. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. I want you to remember what we just talked about in verse 1. I want you to remember the culture that Cornelius is in, who, what Caesarea is. Sin, evil, nasty, broken lives. Yet we're told in verse 2 that Cornelius, he and all his family are devout and God-fearing. Cornelius, a Gentile is devout to God, not to God's. See, in Caesarea, there were, it, paganism was all over the place. There were multiple gods. They, they'd worship everything. Yet here, Cornelius worships one God. He is devout and God-fearing to one God. Not just him, but also his family. They're, they are generous. They are giving themselves away. They pray to God regularly. And what we see in Cornelius is a change that takes place where he is living in a world, he is living in a culture that is made up of sinfulness, it's made up of doing what you feel is good, it is pleasing your pleasures, to all of a sudden Cornelius is a seeker of God. Cornelius goes from, from a, a feel-good culture to focusing on doing what is right, doing what is good, a godless culture to a God-fearing person. He is a... He could have used his, his position in the army as an excuse. I don't have time. I don't have money. I don't, I, 
my family, they're important to me, but I have other priorities. But what we see is that, that he invests in his family, he invests in his culture, he invests in other people. He comes from a do-what-you-want society, and he blesses others. It's as if Cornelius, this Gentile, he, he looks around and he says, there has to be more. I'm living in a broken world. I'm living in, in pain and suffering. I'm seeing the, the, the evilness and the brokenness all around me. There has to be more. I need more. My family needs more. These other people need more. It's almost as if he knew the words of David when David wrote in Psalm 140. I know that the Lord secures justice for the pure and upholds the cause of the needy. God blesses me and I'm going to bless others and, and I'm going to join into that. Cornelius knew the heart of God. Cornelius sought out the heart of God. Cornelius wanted it for others. And church, so must we. So must we. We have to look at where we live and who we are and we have to say, there has to be more. I need to know the heart of God and my family needs to know the heart of God and others need to know the heart of God and things are going to change. Later in chapter 10, verse 36, we see that Peter is in the home of Cornelius. Peter is in Cornelius' home. It's interesting how many times God sends his people into Satan's playland to fix it. Right? Here, Peter is in Cornelius' home. They're talking about God. Starting in verse six, 36, Peter says, You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all? He's talking about Christmas, right? He's talking about Christmas right there. You know what has happened throughout the providence of Judah, beginning, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. What's Jesus doing? Peter's talking about what, what Jesus is doing. What's Jesus doing in that passage? Going around doing good for others going around doing good for others, and that is the very thing that Cornelius grabs onto and realizes that for his spiritual maturity, it's not about a feel-good life, but it's about responding to it and doing good. It has to happen in our lives as well. We have to do some soul searching. We have to, to look at ourselves and we have to ask ourselves, are, are we living in a feel-good society? Are we living in a feel-good kind of life, or are we doing good? with our family, with our marriages, with our friendships, with our finances. We live in a world that is all about immediate gratification. But here's the thing, the more we live in that kind of life, the more we live in a life where it's about immediate gratification, this is what I want, this is gonna please me, this is what I have to have, what, it ha what ends up happening is it erodes our health. It destroys us. I want to share with you a statement. You're going to have to, to, to read this and ponder on this for a little bit. Chasing the feeling good, chase, chasing the feel good destroys the real good. Chasing the feel good destroys the real good. Chasing the feel good destroys the real good. As Paul's leaving, in Acts chapter 20, he's leaving the leaders of Ephesus on his way to Jerusalem. He's giving them his encouragement, his final words. He's, he's reminding them how to live and the instructions of God. In verse 35, it says, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of Jesus, uh, Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That sounds like Christmas, doesn't it? That's what we say Christmas is about. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So what if we made that shift in our life? What if we made a shift in our life from feel good to do good? How would things change? 
How would our world change? How would our environment change? There's another shift that also has to take place, and it's from do, having good intentions to doing good. Having good intentions to actually doing good and being the light of Christ. We hear it all the time, one of these days, right? One of these days, I'm going to. I'm gonna have a conversation. One of these days, I'm gonna lose weight. One of these days, I'm gonna put money in a savings account. One of these days, I'm gonna stop this habit. One of these days. But what do good intentions do for us? Absolutely nothing. Good intentions do nothing for us. Right? We pray a lot. Lord, let me be your hands and feet. Let me do your work to encourage others. Use me to go out. And we have great intentions that, that we wanna be the ones to bless others and we wanna be the ones to be generous and we wanna be the ones to help and we wanna be the ones to, to share truth. We wanna be the ones, Lord, Lord, use me. But usually it stops with good intentions. So how do we make that shift in our life from good intention to actual action? How do we make that shift from, from thinking about it to doing it? Ran across the story of a young lady who was driving through Philadelphia, one of the rougher parts of Philadelphia. And on her trip, she ends up running out of gas, doesn't have her cell phone, all of a sudden realizes that the community she's in, there's bars on the window, there's plight all over the place. She doesn't feel safe. She doesn't want to get out of her car. She's kind of stuck. She doesn't know what to do. And as she's sitting there, all of a sudden, a, a man, a homeless man comes up and taps on her window, which scares her. He asks her to roll down her window. She cracks the window ever so slightly. He says, are you okay? What's going on? She said, I ran out of gas. I don't feel safe. I, I don't know what to do. And she, he said, keep your doors locked, stay put, I'll be back. A homeless man walks away and uh, comes to find out he goes and, and buys a gas can, takes whatever money change he has and buys a couple gallons of gas, puts it in the gas can, walks it back and puts it in the lady's car. As they're talking, uh, he, she finds out a little bit more of his story, why he's homeless, where he came from, the stresses and challenges of life. And all of a sudden she gets home and she wants to do something to bless this man, this homeless man who's, who's lost everything. And so she goes home and she starts a GoFundMe account. Now for some, some of us older ones, that's a social media like fundraising effort where other people can give money to it, okay? So she starts a GoFundMe account because she wants to bless this man. She wants to encourage him and because he blessed her and, and helped her in her situation. She wanted, she wanted to give him you know, a little bit of money to help him out. And she was even blown away herself when it was over $300,000 that had been given that she was able to go and give to this man to help his life change. You see, Cornelius, what we see in Cornelius' life is he lives in, in a world of brokenness. He is a Gentile living in this, this horrible, horrible city. Yet he has the heart of God. He sees God's work. He knows who God is. And he is led to go and change other people's life. He is giving generously to others, to his neighbors and friends and his community. Because he knows that he needs to do that. It goes from good intentions to actually doing good. So we have to shift from feeling good to doing good. We have to shift from having good intentions to action. But we also have to make a shift from satisfaction to understanding that God has made us for so much more. From satisfaction to understanding that God has made us for so much more. If Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 10, for we, he's talking about us, he's talking about you and me, for we are God's handiwork. We are God's handiwork. God has created us. God has put us together. We are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God has created each of us unique, with unique personalities, with unique skill sets and abilities, 
And God has, has asked us to do so much more than what we believe we can do. Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 to let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The hope that we're supposed to have that Paul's talking about is the hope of Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is about. That's what the baby in the manger is all about. It is hope. That we have hope to live. We have hope for truth. In the brokenness of life, we can live. And as Christians, as Christ followers, we are supposed to hold on to that hope. We are supposed to proclaim that hope. We are supposed to live out that hope. But then Paul tells us we're supposed to spur one another on. In the King James Version, it says to provoke one another. It's this idea of, of nagging one another, all right? Why, husbands, don't look at your wives, right? It's this idea of nagging one another, of continually encouraging and irritating one another to action. Spur one another on. Why? Because there are times that we get tired. There are times that we get distracted. There are times that we are weak and we need somebody else to come alongside us and remind us of what the hope is that we're living for. We're supposed to spur one another on. Provoke one another to good deeds, to love. And Paul says, especially especially as the day is approaching. That day is the day of Jesus' return. That day is when we take our last breath here on earth. That day is when we answer for our life. All the more reason, as that day approaches, we need to be encouraging one another, pushing one another, living this life, because God has made us for so much more. We live a life, sadly, where we are satisfied. We're satisfied with where we are. We're satisfied with who we are. We're satisfied with, with our spiritual life. We're satisfied with our finances. We're satisfied with our marriage. We're satisfied with our families. Yet God says there is so much more possibility. There is so much more potential. There is something greater that you can have. Yet we live a life where we're satisfied. We come to church, great. But God says there's so much more. We go to Sunday school, great. We go to small group, great. We're a part of a band group, great. But God says there's so much more. There's so much more. To know who he is, to know his truth, to know his love, to know his forgiveness, there is so much more. Yet we live a life or we're satisfied where we are. We're satisfied. And God says, but I created you. I know you. I knit you together for something wonderful. Going back to Acts chapter 10, the life of Cornelius, look at verse three. It says, one day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear, which I would too if an angel all of a sudden appeared right in front of me. Cornelius says, what is it, Lord? And the angel answers, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. The angel tells Cornelius, your prayers for others, your good deeds for others, your gifts, your generosity for others, God sees it. God sees it. How encouraging would that be? How encouraging would that be for us to know that God hears our prayers, that God knows the acts we do for others, how we're trying to bless, and God is pleased. God is pleased. So God knows. So this month, what if, 
What if we changed Christmas from an event to an awakening? What if we made Christmas not of something that we, we set up and tear down, but some, a, a lifestyle, a, an attitude, a spirit we live in where we worship our Lord, where we encourage others, that we give of ourselves, we pray? What would that look like? What would that look like this month for us to live in such a way that we are looking out? We're looking to bless. We're looking to encourage rather than to receive. So, to help us understand how to do this and practically what's that look like, we've resurrected our, our uh, little cards, our simple way of saying God loves you, no strings attached cards. And so last time we did this, we, we handed a bunch of these out and asked you to go do some random acts of kindness for people and then and leave a card with them or, or buy their meal and then ask the, the waitress to give that card to them. It's a, just an encouragement. It's just a reminder that God has a bigger plan and purpose for their life. Now, some of you thought they were like trading cards and it was like, how quick can I get rid of them? And you're just like, <laughs> that's not the purpose of it. The purpose is for you to go and do something to encourage someone and then to leave them a little extra encouragement. And so up here on the altar, down here at this side, down here at this side, there's some on the back window, there's some down at the Welcome Center. We want you to take a couple cards, take two, three, five, however many, but I want you to pray this week, Lord, how can I bless others? How can I bless and encourage someone else? How can, I, how can I give myself away to be the light of Jesus? How can I live the Christmas spirit this week in a very real and practical way? And then leave them the card, just as an encouragement. Pray for them. Pray that God will continue to work. 